Pretty fascinating stuff. But the, the real thing that I was going to get into, the real thing we were going to sink our teeth into before this North Korea business was International Women's Day. We have so much going on with North Korea, so much going on with tariffs, but we have to take a step back and pause and look at International Women's Day. So all around the world, businesses and banks and countries and social media, and there's protests celebrating International Women's Day. And you see something like this. You see the International Women's Day, and it really gives you a lot of pause. I think people really have to look at the, the way the world is today, the consensus, many of the things we take for granted, and really break down and ask ourselves how these things came to be, why these things came to be. You know, we have this International Women's Day. And, and first, before we get into women and men in 2018 and how we're going to break down the complementarity between men and women and why it's significant, the different gender roles and what they are and, and all the rest. But first, think about International Women's Day. Think of the language that's used on a day like today and with women in general, with women and girls. You hear a lot of words like empowerment. We have to empower women. This is my favorite one. And I hear something like empowerment, I hear Women's Day, and we see these ads that are saying, you know, you go girl. And what's curious about a day like International Women's Day, and what's curious about the language and the propaganda, is the fundamental paradox that underwrites this. The fundamental paradox that underwrites a lot of the so-called identity politics, as the left has it in America Day. I, today, I happen to be a big believer in identity politics in the sense that I don't think there is politics outside of identity, but I'm talking specifically with regard to the victim politics of the left, which is to say the paradox that underwrites this for blacks, for women, for Hispanics, for Muslims, for homosexuals, for transgenders, for all the different minorities, the victim groups, is this curious paradox that at once women are tough, Women are smart. You can do it. You are just as good. You're just as smart. And actually, you're smarter. And actually, you're stronger. And actually, studies say that women are tougher and men just need them to show them how it goes. And at once, there's this message of they are equal or better. But then at the same time, doesn't giving women their own day, doesn't that it's necessary, that it's incumbent on businesses and banks and leaders to give them an extra leg up, to give them their own day, to give them a special consideration, a, a peculiar, a distinction between men and say, you have to be lifted up. You have to be empowered from without, not from within. It's not you who lifts yourself up. You have to be lifted up from without. You need other powerful people to come in and lift yourself up. And this is the peculiar contradiction which underwrites all the politics of minorities in these different groups, all groups except for white people, except for white men, straight white men, really, straight white Christian American men in particular, if we're going to get down to the details. But that's the paradox that underwrites all under people, which is at once they are strong, at once they are, they are warriors, but at the same time they need, at the same time they need, they they have to have this support. They have to have their own day. We have to recognize them. We have to distinguish them. And that is, of course, contradictory. Wouldn't it presuppose giving them their own day that they are weaker, that they need something else? And if they need something, doesn't that presuppose that they are lesser in many ways? And of course they are. Of course they are. Of course women and men are not equal. That's the message today for International Women's Day. Women and men are not equal. They're not the same. That doesn't mean they're inferior. That doesn't mean men are superior. That doesn't mean women are superior and men are inferior. There's this very interesting, another interesting contradiction that exists today, where if you're against egalitarianism, which egalitarianism is, is radical equality, it's the belief that, you know, we're all, we're all just pink, we're all just these androgynous flesh units, men and women, black and white, there's no distinctions, we're all the same. The contradiction inherent in egalitarianism, or maybe the, the presupposition is that if you believe in difference, you believe in hierarchy. That if you believe that men and women are different, well, you believe that one is better than the other. One is superior. This We also hear the same kind of rhetoric with race. If you believe that white and black people are different, you must necessarily believe that one is better than the other. If you believe that Christianity and Islam are different at a fundamental level, well, you must necessarily believe that one is better than the other. If you think that these people belong in that country so that they can be happy and do their own thing, well, you just must think that this is your country because you're better. And of course, none of this is true. Of course, none of this is true. We look at men and women, and they are different qualitatively and quantitatively. Men are taller than women. 
Men are stronger than women. They have more muscle mass. When we say strong, strong is a very loaded term. Or if you say something like men are stronger than women, and we all know what that means. They'll say women are strong because they endure hardships you can't even imagine. And maybe while that's certainly true, they have emotional fortitude. We're talking about muscle mass. Quantitatively, men on average have more muscle mass. They grow taller. They grow larger. They have a different bone structure. They hit puberty at different ages. Their bones fuse at different ages. Their intelligence is different. Their brain development is different. You know, here's a very interesting thing about their brain chemistry, where people might say about men being smarter or women being smarter. The truth of the matter is that women, on average, I believe they have a higher intelligence. I don't know if I would agree with that, but there are studies that say that women, on average, have a higher intelligence. But at the same time, men have a higher spread of intelligence, that they have more savants, they have more geniuses, more people at the upper end, and they also have more dummies, more people that are under the average, more people that are going to be, you know, on the lower, the left side of the bell curve. And there's a perfect difference. I think that epitomizes it, where just because they are different, just because there is a greater spread and one has, uh, you know, maybe a higher average, that doesn't mean that one is better than the other. That doesn't mean that, well, men, because they have more geniuses, they are smarter, they are superior. And because women have a higher average, they are smarter, they are superior, but we just allow them to be different. And the same is true of anatomy. The same is true of, of all the other differences. The qualitative and quantitative differences exist. And here's the kicker. Here's why the transgenderism and all the rest is so destructive. The reason why there are differences, the reason why we believe in difference, and that's not problematic for our worldview, is because we believe in the comparative advantage of men and women. The reason that they can be different while being equal is because they were both made to complement each other. They were made to satisfy different roles, different responsibilities. If you believe that men and women, their sole task, their sole obligation in life is to become wealthy and to pursue pleasure and to consume, well then, your world, you would have a big problem with men and women being different. Because if both people are one and the same and pursuing the same goals, they're just these atomized individuals and all they want is to have big houses and fast cars and they want to have full bellies and a lot of sexual pleasure, then yes, this would be a hierarchy. You would say that men are better than women because they're more aggressive and they are, they do have more geniuses and they're more assertive and they take much more risk than women. And you would say that, yes, if we're judging it just by this metric at pursuing the same goal, that men are better if you're an egalitarian. But here's why that's not a trouble for our worldview. We say that women are better, they are better suited and they are superior in their function, in their role, which is, of course, the birthing, the rearing, the nurturing of children and men are better and superior in their domain, which is to protect the woman, to go out and provide for the woman and for the family at large. And so when you have a worldview that's constructed, and this is why our worldview is coherent, the reason that we can allot for different genders, different sexes that are in the real sense of the word different is because we see them as having different final causes in, a, in an Aristotelian sense, in a teleological sense. We see men and women not as like they came out of nowhere. Oh, poof. Here's mankind, and there's two kinds of men. There's men and there's women. And it doesn't really matter. That's just arbitrary. They just are the way they are. And some are taller and some are shorter. And some have this part and some have that part. And some have breasts and some don't. But this is these are all just minor details. They're pursuing the same thing. All they want is pleasure. And in a very liberal, capitalist, late-stage capitalist sense of the word, they all just want the same thing. They're all directed towards the same goal. Or if there is no goal direct in this, if there is, they're all directed towards the same thing. Well, we see men and women as created for a purpose. That's where religion and metaphysics comes into it. We see men and women as created towards a specific end with a certain goal in mind. That men would serve this function, and that's why they're different in this way. That's why they're better in some respects than women in their own domain. And women are better in some respects than men in their domain because they are designed, they have a goal directedness, they are aimed towards a specific ends. The rearing and the nurturing of children for one, and the protecting and the provision for women and children in the other. And here's why this is so fundamental. Here's why this is important. We see the different masculine and feminine virtues. And let me pull this out over here. We're going to have to figure something out with this microphone and the whiteboard because it never works so well. Either the sound is, is bad and then the lighting is goofy, but we'll turn up the gain here. So here you have men. These are the blue guys. 
And you have women, these are the pink, the ladies. And here are your masculine virtues, here are your feminine virtues, and here's why this is consequential. When we talk about men and women, when we talk about teleology, we talk about goal directedness. This is not this is not just, you know, like Oxford talk. This is not just intellectual talk. And let me actually increase the brightness here, because whenever the uh, the whiteboard comes out, it throws off our white balance. So let me do a little a little boomer tech here. Will that will that help it? Maybe if I do this. No, that's not it. Maybe if I do that. No, that's not it. All right, you know what? Whatever. Who cares? We're getting off track. So we'll just have to deal. It's a little bit darker. The studio's having some trouble here, but I assure you that's just uh, optical illusion. So the reason why this is consequential, we talk about goal-directedness, why this is not just pie-in-the-sky abstraction talk. Here's why this is important. Men have certain biological differences from women, and they have, they have spiritual differences from women as well. We believe, at least we in a traditional sense of the word, we believe that men are not just material, they're not just atoms and neurons and, and flesh and blood, but they also have an essence, they also have a spirit, there's also a formal cause to men. And they have virtues, they have different proclivities in a personal way, that they, they are better suited towards aggression, strength, heroism. These are masculine virtues. Masculinity is a form in itself. You have the male body, but you have a masculine spirit, a masculine energy, and women have the same. Now, men and women were created to complement each other, not just biologically, in that you have male and female parts, and, and it's not, again, that's not an arbitrary thing, that that it fits, it makes sense, you know, that if you look at a plug that goes into a wall socket, it just makes sense. That's, that's how it was designed to work and towards a certain end. And not only do you have a biological complementarity in that sense, but you also have a complementarity in a social sense, that the different virtues of men and women complement each other, that a man is aggressive and they take risks and they're strong and they have to have a predatory animalistic instinct because they may have to kill people that want to hurt their family and they may have to kill animals, ferocious animals to, to fend for themselves, at least in, in ancient times. Nowadays, they have to compete for resources. And so they're strong and they complement the woman and that they have to protect. They have to have this particular energy to make up for the women where they are softer and they are more gentle and they don't have those same capacities and in the same sense women are patient and they are caring and they're nurturing and they're refined and they temper that animosity that predatory instinct in men they're calm and they are able to rear the children with warmth with tenderness they are there to temper the masculinity of men and so there is this complementarity on a biological and a spiritual level and when this is functioning, when this is in harmony, when the complementarity exists on both levels and you have marriages and, and when these things are all syncing up together, you have marriages and long marriages and healthy marriages, this all contributes to what we're all here for at the end of the day. Kids, happy, healthy, well-developed, well-adjusted children. If mommy and daddy are masculine and feminine and you have a real father who is a man and a real mother who is a woman and they're functional together and they love each other and they have an enduring marriage and they complement each other in those ways hey then the kids are going to be okay they understand what it means to be a man they understand what it means to be a woman so their worldview makes sense they know who they are they know who they are in their own skin they love themselves and they're happy and they're good and they go out and they meet up with other men and women and they can procreate for the next generation this is how the world is supposed to function this is the foundation of my worldview my worldview is not based on at the end of the day it's, it's not so much based on race it's not based on ideology it's not based on economy it's not based on free trade it's based on this if this is in order, if this triangle is working properly and men and women are okay and the kids are okay, we're, we are so much better off no matter what economic system, no matter what anything else looks like. If this is in harmony, odds are you're going to fix the problems that you have, whether demographic, healthcare, immigration, any problem that you have. If this gets back in order, all of this contributes to solving problems. Kids are happy and healthy. That means they're educated. That means they're in, they have a sound mind. That means they're wise. And they're going to be able to make good decisions. That means they're working and, and all the rest. It's very good. Well, what happens is, is nowadays you have all these things are out of whack. Men are becoming feminized and women are becoming masculinized. When they mix together in schools, when they grow up together in schools and they grow up side by side and you have the elimination of male and female spaces that men and women have been desegregated, you have kind of this, 
process of osmosis where the women pick up the traits of the men and they become coarse, they become profane, they become, you know, inferior men in, in a phrase, to borrow a phrase from Yaki. And men adopt all the traits of women. They become feminized. They adopt this, this up-talking that women do. They adopt this, this gentleness, this feebleness. They become weak. They become too sensitive. They can't exercise their masculine virtues. And when this stuff is out of whack, it throws everything out of whack. Courtship becomes confusing. Nobody knows what the rules are. Should we be gentlemen? Should we be dominating or should we be passive? Should we be effeminate? For women, should they be gentle? Should they be traditional? Should they expect men to take the lead or should they be out there paying their way and pulling their own chairs out for themselves and opening their own doors? And you know, These are minor things, but they represent broader disparities or, or broader dissonance between what women understand themselves to be and what society says they are. And you throw these virtues out of whack. Men and women are not able to relate to each other in a healthy way. Courtship becomes impossible. Relationships become difficult. Marriages become confusing. Because there is so much conflict and, and people don't know how to navigate in these changing times, they dissolve and they fall apart. And then what happens to the kitties? What happens to the kitties? They're either not made or they come up in broken homes or they come up in single parent homes and then they don't know what a man is or what a woman is and they don't know how they're supposed to relate to the opposite sex they don't have both energies in their parenting and then it all falls apart so this is at the end of the day if you think about why we're here what we're directed towards why we have certain you know what what liberals might call fastidial reproductive organs why we why it's all like this this is the reason and this is fundamentally the difference in worldview between traditionalists and, and liberals or the left or you know whatever you want to call it. The, the real fundamental difference in worldview is not between right-wing people and left-wing people. It's not capitalists and communists. It's not you know the real racists and the, what the media calls racists. The real difference is do you believe in truth? Do you believe that the world as it was 50 years ago was a place of racism and sexism and xenophobia and misogyny and homophobia. Do you think that all the prejudices and all the traditions of the past were arbitrary, they were the result of accident or ignorance, or do you believe that the world has a rhyme and a reason to it? Do you believe that the world has a reason that things exist the way they are? Do you believe that things are different and they're directed towards goals? Or do you believe that we're all just, we're all just different flesh animals were all the same all pink on the inside and everything that came before 1991 or everything that came before the united nations or everything that came before the atlantic charter was just ignorant and it was bigoted they just didn't know as much as we did and that's the difference between the two different worldviews that's why these things can never be reconciled i don't think you'll ever resolve this with a debate because we're operating on two different dimensions two different planets different presuppositions different different metaphysics and until we can address these differences on that level, until we can sit down and have a debate about our political differences on that higher level of metaphysics, debating the presuppositions that underlie the philosophy and the ideology and therefore the political opinions, we're never going to resolve it. But I think more and more you're seeing people come around to it. I think Generation Z is coming around to it because it's intuitive. It's natural to people. You understand that all the left-wing social experiments and social projects, they entail rewriting, they entail reprogramming. If women or blacks or Hispanics or whoever, if they're not thinking the right way, well, they are just ignorant. They have to be re-educated. They have to be taught. They have to be indoctrinated in public school and then in college and then with media and commercials. You ever notice that you see something on that unnatural on television and you have to, you have to rewire your brain? It's, it's put out there to rewire your brain to say, this is normal, actually. We have to artificially create this image to get you to start thinking in a natural way. And isn't that sort of contradictory? It's natural, it's intuitive that the world is the way it is. That boys are going to be boys and girls are going to be girls. And so I think Generation Z is waking up to it. And, and maybe possibly the best example of this, which I like to bring up, is, is the movie Fifty Shades of Grey or the book Fifty Shades of Grey. Because here is a book which is degenerate, which is disgusting, but here is a book which at the end of the day has a very perverted but traditional gender role. It has a very perverted but traditional worldview in the sense that you strip away all the sick and depraved stuff and here is 
a man being masculine and aggressive, and, and it's taken, it's perverted, it's taken to these cartoonish, it's turned into a caricature, a mockery of what it's supposed to be, but you boil it down, and here you have this, this uncontrolled raw and masculine energy, which is problematic, and then you have the woman, who is equally problematic, that she's submissive and all the rest, and in a very sick and perverted way, but look at who supported that project. In the age of feminism, in the age of female empowerment, in the age of we're free from our biological and sociological constraints, marriage is slavery and having kids is a shackle, it's a ball and chain around the ankle of women and their potential to break the glass ceiling. Who drove the sales of the books? Who drove this to the number one sold book on the New York Times list? Who drove the movie to be a huge blockbuster? It was women. It was women. And, and if you're really scrutinizing you can see this everywhere. The writing on the wall is everywhere where women are craving real men again. They're craving real masculinity again. And men, I think, are craving real femininity in the same way. Problem is, because the society has told men and women that these are wrong, if you, uh, if you play into that, if, if women want to have a strong husband and they want to have kids and they want to be a mom, well, they're oppressed. They're wrong to think that. They've been brainwashed. You can't trust yourself. You have to trust the communist literature. You have to trust the Marxist propaganda. People just repress these natural instincts. They repress these intuitive feelings. And naturally, they, they come to the surface in unhealthy ways, in perverted, distorted ways. And I think that's what you're seeing on both sides of the equation. I think in many ways, you know, people talk about the trap question, in the, the far right, I think an anime, I think this is a perversion of men's desire for feminine women again. I think with women, when you hear a lot of this stuff about, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey and that kind of thing, I think it's equally their desire for strong and masculine men. I don't think it's any secret. So that's what we have to think about on International Women's Day. Get rid of it. We have to go back. The, the men and Women's Day is Mother's Day and Father's Day. That's what's important. Not about people as ends in themselves, but as, as connected, as part of a process. I think that's another fundamental difference, is the liberals and the left, and, and maybe more broadly, neoliberals, neoconservatives, these utopian, these progressive people, they see men and women, they see the individual as an end in itself. You are nothing more than yourself. You're just you. And community doesn't matter. Mom and dad don't matter. Kids, eh, if, you, if you want them, if they're going to make you happy, Sex, if it makes you happy, bigger house, hey, if it floats your boat, if that's what you want, and it's all about you, it's all about me, 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 it's a solipsistic world that the individual is the end in himself. We want to, and, and you hear this on Twitter, I'm living my best life. I'm being my authentic self. I shouldn't have to feel this way. I shouldn't have to feel that way. I shouldn't be responsible for this. And that's what the consumer, the neoliberal, sees himself as. We're not a part of anything larger. We're an end in our, ourselves. And the conservative, the traditionalist says, no, we're a part of something bigger. We don't celebrate Women's Day. We celebrate Mother's Day. We celebrate Father's Day. We don't see ourselves as, well, I'm just this Adam. No, we're a part of a legacy. We're a part of a continuum, past, present, and future, that we have parents and their parents had parents. And now here we are and we'll have children and our children will have children. And we're not just connected vertically in time, but also horizontally. We're in a community among other people, and we have to be considerate and cognizant of those other people. And you're in a community with other men and women. You're in a community with other men and also other women and also people in your nation and your religious affiliation. And I think that's another fundamental difference. But that's what we have to think about on Women's Day. We have to really break down what are the assumptions, what's the metaphysics behind this. It doesn't make any sense to us, but we have to ask ourselves why. It's not sufficient to say it's crazy. It's not sufficient to, sufficient to say this is lunacy. The world has gone mad. We have to ask ourselves why. Why is it crazy to us? For what reason? What's the alternative? What instinct? By what instinct do we say it's crazy? By what standard do we say it's crazy? Until he can answer those questions, I don't think we can adequately reform. I don't think we, we can adequately mount a, a counteroffensive. So, so that's Women's Day. Woohoo, you know, we respect women. We love women. We got to bring women back. Women have become these 
like I said, these coarse, these profane people, you gotta, we gotta bring back the real broads, the real wives. I think everybody would be so much happier. I think few people understand. I think few people will acknowledge these days how much happier we would all be if we could all just be who we are, if we could all just become who we are, as, uh, as Spencer likes to say, which was actually uh, an adage that Nietzsche liked. But if we could just be who we are, if we could just be men and women could just be women and whites could just be whites and blacks can be blacks and nobody would bother saying you have to meet this expectation, you have to prove these people wrong, we'd be so much happier, folks, if we just told the truth, if we just said what's on our mind, but we can't do it or else we get fired. So that's Women's Day. I don't know, should we talk about the tariffs? Do we have enough time? It's 745 let me check and see how many Super Chats we have. If we have a ton, we'll just get to Super Chats. If not, we'll spend a little time on the tariffs. I think we'll just do the tariffs because we don't have that many Super Chats. Looks like we're taking a real dive here. Is there blood sports going on? Because we went from like 7.50 on Monday down to 4.30 today. What's going on, folks? Um, but I guess we'll, we'll cover briefly the tariffs. And, and just one final note. I think it does tie in pretty nicely to the men and the women stuff. The tariffs were signed into law today on steel and aluminum, and we talked about this all week. We talked about this all week last week, the benefits of tariffs, how they're, they're bringing back millions of jobs, how they can open back our factories if, if done correctly, and, and that's great. But what's also interesting about tariffs is what they do is they prioritize production over consumption. And that's just the last note that I will leave on tariffs. It's kind of interesting how the two connect. You're starting to see the connections in the different issues be they economic, be they demographic, social, it's all connected. They're not these isolated, pigeonholed different issues. They're all connected to a larger worldview that when we talk about tariffs, we're saying we want to produce instead of consume. We don't just want to have and, and you know buy products and use products. We want to make the products. That's how we see a country that is successful, that is self-sufficient. And in the same way, isn't that what we're saying about men and women? We don't want to just consume life. We want to produce life. We don't want to just participate and take part in it. We want to prolong it. We want to engage with it. So I think that's just an interesting tie-in. Many people say, a person like Destiny with no imagination, a last man will say, that's, he thinks tariffs are like men and women. But I think people can see the similarities there. But 